very happy and honored to introduce my friend and colleague and cherished guest speaker, Maria Sirwa, who many of you already know, and I'll just say a few things about her. Uh, she is an inspirational speaker, a consultant, and a licensed psychologist. She's been working in the field of wellness and the science of positive psychology for over 20 years. Um, you know, and her focus in her work has been predominantly in resilience and in helping people cope with stress and grief and trauma and helping people through life transitions. And she has some great books. One is called Everyday Counts, and the other is called A Short Course in Happiness After Loss. So I'm uh, very happy to be here with you, Maria. You're one of those uh, people in this field that whenever I see your name or whenever we make contact with one another, I just get a big smile on my face. And I, I could say that about a few people, but for sure you are one of those few. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Ryan. It's wonderful to be part of the Strengths family. And um, I love this invitation to talk today. I was, if it's right, well, right with you, I want to be talking a little bit about hope and a little bit about zest. Awesome. That's perfect. You know, and I, I wanted to ask, you know, say that, you know, your main work throughout your life, as far as I understand it, has been helping people through hard times. It, it's almost as if you were tailor-made for this experience of what's going on here in today's pandemic world. You know, you've helped countless people find acceptance, help countless people find meaning, countless people find resilience to overcome all these, these different challenges and to be able to move through different transitions in their life, whatever that transition might be. Um, so what are you saying to people at this time uh, dealing with grief and suffering? What are you saying to them these days? So the very first thing that I'm saying is that self-care is not an option. It's absolutely mandatory. So whatever that looks like for you in terms of whatever nourishes you or strengthens you or inspires you, those are the three sort of driving self-care questions. And that, that's where we all have to begin, you know, from, from the place we are at, right? Resilience is cultivated when we first acknowledge our experience. Mm. And so can you say those three things again? So whatever nourishes you? Strengthens you. Strengthens you. Or, or inspires you. Or inspires you. Uh, can you give us like maybe one example of each of those three? So what nourishes me is to get outside into nature and remember that the world is bigger than the four walls I spend a lot of time on in the Zoom world now. <laughs> um, and what strengthens me is practicing, absolutely practicing my character strengths, one of which I'll talk about today is zest. Well, so when I first took the test, zest was 23 out of 24 and it pissed me off. <laughs> so I really consciously worked hard and I got it up to 15 and now I think it's up to nine. Mm. So I am determined <laughs> to keep it in my top 10. Just climbing um, the ladder. <laughs> climbing the ladder. So practicing zest and then that's what strengthens me. And then what um, inspires me is watching beautiful inspirational videos like John Krasinski's Some Good News weekly mm. series and so on. So those mm. are just tiny examples of ways that we can take care of ourselves by carving out just a few minutes every day to answer one of those questions. So beautiful. And I, I love that because it's so practical. I mean, we always try to be super practical here and that's just painfully practical for people is they can ask those questions maybe at the beginning of the day, middle of the day, whatever, of what is nourishing, what, what could nourish me right now and let me go do it. What could strengthen me? What could inspire me? So beautifully said. And I love that framework. I haven't heard you say that before and I yeah. just missed it. Um, well, now, yeah, I know you've been thinking about hope and zest at these time, times. You know, I want to hear, hear what you have to yeah. say about these character strengths in, in any order that you like. You know, these. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. So I want to frame it first in the context of COVID-19. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I, to do so, I want to use a model from... Um, Dr. Joan Borisenko, who's the world thought leader in the field of mind-body medicine. And she has this beautiful image of the journey of transformation as the image of a smile. And that you're in life and something happens like COVID-19 and it sends us into a liminal time where things that have been true are no longer true. And in this liminal space, as we're moving into the new normal, we're caught sort of at the bottom of the smile between what is no longer true and what is not yet true. 
And in order to navigate that liminal space, so think those of us whose jobs are in transition or those of us who suddenly the kids came back home and now we have to school them or um, those of us who are sheltering alone, worried about others, right? We, things that had been true have fallen apart, but the new normals are emerging weirdly and slowly and uncertainly. And I'm not even sure that's a word. And in that space between what is no longer and not yet true, resilience is, lives in the territory of hope and in the territory of courage. Hmm. And the reason I mentioned the word courage is because that's where zest comes in. So but let me, I'll talk a little bit about hope and then a little bit about zest. Perfect. Sounds great. So Jerome Grootman from the field of medical oncology helped us understand about 20 years ago that hope lives in paradox between the capacity to face reality exactly as it is, like I'm, I'm bored out of my mind or I, I can't believe this, ha I, I, I'm just so anxious, I have no idea if my job's gonna be relevant anymore or I'm so sad about the state of the world, right? We have to face reality as it is, experience our experience fully. But then we need to build in an and. Resilient folk face reality and they build in an and. And on the other side of the and, they consciously and mindfully move toward a slightly better future, a future that's self-defined. So what would a better afternoon look like or a better next moment or maybe even a better day, right? And that's, and often on the other side of the end is where character strengths live, right? I'm anxious and I can call my friends. I can lean on my strength of kinship, of community, right? I'm um, frightened about the health of my mother 2,000 miles away and I know that I can lean on my perspective, right? She's, she's, she's done well, she's being thoughtful, she's isolating beautifully, it's gonna be okay, right? So that model of hope that comes to us from the world of meta-oncology matches beautifully the model of grounded optimism that emerged in the field of positive psychology, which is the capacity to face reality and then choose a practice, a thought, an action that takes us to a slightly better place. So hope isn't this delusional, fantastical, everything's gonna be wonderful and perfect. It's a very actually grounded understanding that we can co-create with life every day. Mm. Does that make sense, Ryan? It does, yeah. And I just imagine, that's hope is one of my signature strengths. And so I, I think that kind of describes me you know, very closely as well, that I'm, where I am most grounded, I'm also looking to the future, but also kind of co-creating possibilities and, you know, co-creating many possibilities and feeling the sense that I can reach those, those points. Right, right. But in order, so if you see yourself at the bottom of that smile shape that Dr. Borisenko talked about, and we have the hope, which is kind of like looking up, right? Looking up into the possibility, the new normal or you know, to quote the poet David White, the, the, the emerging horizon, right? We still need, you know, like some energy, some vitality to hope in and of itself does not cultivate change. We need some like a booster, right? And that's where zest comes in because, and this was fascinating to me when I read the signature strength stuff so many years ago, the character strength stuff so many years ago, I was fascinated to see that zest, enthusiasm, bringing your whole heart to the moment lives under the virtue of courage. And when I thought about it, that actually makes perfect sense because when we bring our whole heart to whatever it is that we are enlivened by or inspired by, it, there, there's energy, there's that, that felt body response that Barbara Fredrickson talks about, this action motivation toward actually movement, right? Creating, building, structuring, reaching out, right? The, a zest is not a passive sort of witnessing of life. It's, it's the actual engagement in life. And so even in the darkest moments, some of the heart, I'm, I'm in a moment right now where one of my dearest friends is dying of cancer and I will not be able to say goodbye to him. I, I will, we, we FaceTime and, and he's, he's needing more and more morphine. So I'm not sure, you know, the hospice FaceTime Zoom is going to work much longer and I will not be with him. And that is excruciating. And I can still bring my whole heart 
to those few moments that we have together to flood him with love and remembrances and reminders of how, you know, we're, our love is going to continue no matter what. And in the bringing of our heart is the capacity to stay brave, to stay brave. And so I like to think of that bottom part of the smile between what was no longer true and what is not yet true as the time of deep, deep, deep courage and that hope and zest are two of the primary ingredients. Well, beautiful example. And yeah. So what, what about for people who, you know, really are struggling to find either hope or zest? Like, is there anything that you would suggest for building up one or both of them? Yes. I have an expression I use called track what you love as long like as if you are tracking the scent of you know a rabbit in the woods that that when we pay attention to whatever we love even the the small loves like your Pez collection behind you <laughs> or behind me you can see peonies on the bookshelf I love flowers and and um, garden and gardening and so on and so whenever we pay attention to the small things that enliven us or the medium things or the large things, as we track what we love, I find that vitality naturally increases and our sense of being connected to the world as opposed to disconnected through our pain, our sense of connection increases. And that enables us to actually look up again with a little bit more hope. Well, thank you for, for bringing in my Pez collection, by the way, we're going to present now on that. Now, um, so in this, at, at these times of, of great suffering and loss, there's, there's a lot of talk on the importance of turning toward acceptance, turning toward meaning. What, are, what would you say about each of those and how they're similar, how they're different, what you suggest to people as you've helped guide them? Yeah. So acceptance is like step one foundation, found fundamental to resilience. Um, Denial works for about 48 hours and then, and then resilient folk take it in. They take in the information, they take in the data, they take in what they're feeling and then they make healthier choices about what, what to do with them, right? So acceptance is absolutely, absolutely crucial. What was the other term you used? Oh, meaning. Meaning. Finding meaning in the, okay. in the term. Yeah. So here's the thing about meaning and and so forgive me because I really do, I come from the death and dying world from pediatric oncology. And so my understanding and appreciation of meaning really has emerged more from the witnessing of the harshest moments in life as opposed to ordinary moments. So I just want to acknowledge that as a kind of foundation of my approach. Meaning in the harshest moments does not emerge immediately. And actually, if we seek to name something as meaningful or significant too quickly, usually that's just because we're trying to avoid really the deep experience of the pain. Meaning is something that can be invested in every day, like tracking what you love, because those are important and significant to you. And at the same time, the larger meanings need time to emerge. So after the loss of my brother, that sense of meaning of having integrated his death took about two to three years. So I, want, I do want to give people permission to know that they may not know the meaning of this time fully, COVID-19, for some months to come. Having said that, we can invest in the small meanings like the Pez collection or the flowers every day. Hmm. Thank you. I love that. A great explanation. Well, be, before we move into a, a meditation experience for everybody, um, any, anything else that you'd like to, to share with, with us, uh, you know, in, in dealing with this time of COVID-19 and kind of embracing our suffering and moving forward in, in this and figuring out our, where we're headed? Yeah. If you think of zest, not in terms of necessarily jubilation, but more right now in terms of keep bringing your whole heart to the moment, I'm finding that even at work or with people you know, with these blurred work home boundaries, um, the thought of actually mindfully choosing to bring my heart just for five minutes to the day, like that I'll bring my heart fully present to the moments when I wake my children up, 
that's all I'm asking of myself, just five minutes of wholeheartedness or five minutes of wholeheartedness, you know, launching a conversation with a colleague, um, that it marks the day as non-ordinary, that it actually, it, 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 it creates a kind of shimmer or ignition to the day that is sustaining, not only physically within us, but in the sense of, of how we've experienced the day. And this mitigates against this COVID fatigue that we're all experiencing of, oh my God, it, what difference does it make if it's Wednesday or Thursday or Friday? It's like the same thing all over, right? And so it's a way in which we authentically step into the moment and shape it. So zest is not only a driver for courage, it's a driver for that personal leadership that we're all looking for to, in terms of building resilient capacity. Mm. When I love that too, because if we can do those five minute experiences for ourselves in a particular day, that it is, it's creating uh, something sacred for ourselves. And, and I agree with you, that sense of specialness, sacredness really can be long lasting and, and push us through each particular day. And yeah, and, and so would you say the same thing in terms of when as people start to get concerned with kind of the long ball with COVID-19? I know some people are getting back to work and they're not looking at the long ball and, and others are thinking this is going to go on forever in some way. There's going to be second waves and third waves. And, you know, would you recommend that moment to moment uh, experience that you just noted or would you suggest other things? You know, years ago when I started working at um – one of the hospitals in Boston, the chief of medicine in pediatric oncology saw me standing in the hall just beside myself with grief one day. And he, he gave me some of the wisest advice. He said, you know, in the worst moments, the game is step by step, moment by moment and breath by breath. And I think right now we are in a grand experiment. You know, some of the states are opening up. Some of the golf courses are opening up. Some aren't at all. Germany is sending certain age group students back to school. Denmark is sending a different age group students back to school. Wuhan is, you know, we're, it's a grand experiment to see what happens. And we don't know. But what we do know is that we have control over the one thing humanity has always had control over once we became conscious, which is how we show up. Mm. And so to really just stay focused there, we've got control over the one thing we must have control over, which is who we are and how we respond and what we choose to bring to the day. Thank you. Would you mind leading us in uh, meditation in a few minutes or so? Not at all. And I would love to just bring us into a form of meditation that um, is called metta, which is loving kindness. And this is an, the reason I like this is because it's an opportunity to increase your enthusiasm, your zest about 3%. So if you feel comfortable, I'm going to invite you to place your hand or hands on your heart. And metta is a call and response. So um, I'm going to repeat a phrase. We're going to begin with the I, and then we're going to move to the you, and then to the we. And just invite you to repeat after me. And with each phrase, just a tiny bit more enthusiasm, a tiny bit more of your heart involved. So we'll begin with the self first. May I be happy. May, may, I, be happy. may I be healthy. May I be healthy. May I ride the wave of my life. May I ride the wave of my life. May I find peace no matter what. May I find peace no matter what. And now bringing to mind the image of someone you love dearly. 5% more enthusiasm. May you be happy. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be healthy. May you ride the wave of your life. May you ride the wave of your life. May you find peace no matter what. May you find peace no matter what. And now bringing to mind the entire world, all the sentient beings, those you love, those you love you just haven't met yet, plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the kingdoms of the skies. And again, just a little bit more of your heart. May we be happy. 
May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be healthy. May we ride the waves of our lives. May we ride the waves of our lives. And may we find peace no matter what. May we find peace no matter what. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. <laughs>